I'm Belle Donati. It's 10 o'clock in the evening here in the French capital. The headlines. A controversial move that could derail Middle East peace talks. Donald Trump appears on the verge of formally recognising Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Spain's Supreme Court withdraws its international arrest warrant for Catalonia's former leader, but Carles Puigdemont is far from off the hook. And the International Olympic Committee bans Russia from next year's Games after a state-sponsored doping scandal that has shaken the athletics world for more than two years. Good to have you with us. We begin tonight with a new twist in Catalonia's independence tale. Spain's Supreme Court has withdrawn its international arrest warrant for the former Catalan leader, who's been living in Belgium in self-imposed exile since the end of October. Carles Puigdemont is still likely to be detained if he returns to Spain. He faces charges of sedition and rebellion there, relating to an illegal independence referendum two months ago. Selena Sykes reports. An election campaign like no other. European arrest warrants for Carlos Puigdemont and four members of his former cabinet have been withdrawn. But for now, the ousted Catalan leaders won't be returning home to fight the region's upcoming elections. The five who are currently in Brussels could still be arrested on charges of rebellion, sedition and misuse of public funds if they go back to Spain. The Spanish Supreme Court said it had withdrawn the European arrest warrants because it could not have a situation where a Belgian government could potentially change the charges made against them. Particularly the most serious, rebellion, which does not exist under Belgian legislation. The Supreme Court said the removal of the arrest warrant would allow Spain full control over the investigation. Puigdemont's lawyer said the independence leader will remain in Belgium for the moment. Theoretically, there will be no influence <coughs> of this step in the proceeding, no influence in Spain, no. But in Belgium, it means that the judge will not make a judgment of extradition. Meanwhile, four former members of the Catalan government released from prison in Madrid on Monday said the independence movement had not been swayed and hoped for Puigdemont's return. I'm telling you this loud and clear. We have left prison with our dignity, our ideals and our principles stronger than ever. We want our friends free, and we want President Puigdemont back to Catalonia once again as the legitimate president. Two Catalan ex-ministers, including the former vice president, remain in custody in Spain. Well, for more on this, let's bring in Roberto Robales, senior associate at the London-based public policy consultancy Global C Council. Uh, Roberto, thanks for joining us here on France 24. Thank now. You for uh, at first glance, this could seem uh, like a good thing for Puigdemont. Uh, it looks as though potentially he could be off the hook. Uh, but that's not the whole story, is it? Well, that's right. And as your colleague pointed out earlier, the, the issue here is not so much that the Spanish judge of the Supreme Court wants to somehow diminish the charges against Puigdemont. If anything, it's the reverse. The concern of the Spanish uh, Supreme Court judge is that under the terms of the European arrest warrant, the Belgian judicial system, the Belgian judge may choose to somehow remove uh, the char some of the charges that are filed against Mr. Puigdemont, which means that when he would be returned to Spain, he would not necessarily face all the charges that were initially filed against him. And the Spanish judge is concerned that this would diminish the credibility and the cohesiveness of the entire judicial process that is now taking place against the former members of the Catalan government and former members and leading officials in the Catalan parliament. You may remember a couple of weeks ago, for the very same reason, the Spanish Supreme Court decided to take over uh, the parallel judicial process that was taking place in the High Court against the um, leaders of the Catalan parliament uh, uh, with the justification that, of because this was one 
one whole crime with many perpetrators in in one large, if you like, conspiracy, for lack of a better word, then they should all be tried under the same um, by the same court. And this is the very same reason why the judge has decided not to take a gamble in somehow having Puigdemont and the other members of his uh, former government there that are still in Brussels uh, judged somehow with, with lesser charges than uh, the colleagues who remained in Spain. Absolutely. So essentially, he, the, the Spanish courts can now go after Puigdemont uh, and his uh, colleagues on sedition uh, charges and rebellion charges. Um, where does this latest development leave, uh, do you think, the independence movement? Uh, because, of course, we're approaching the regional elections on the 21st of December. Can uh, Puigdemont even be elected if he's not in Spain or in uh, Catalonia? Well, um, he, he's on the candidate list, and so he's allowed to run. Of course, the difficulty is that he will almost certainly be unable to take his, his seat in the Catalan Parliament unless he were to, to return to Spain. In terms of what this does to the, to the electorate, um, it's interesting that despite the, the latest round of, of judicial, um, the ju judicial process and the charges filed against the members of the uh, former Catalan government, there hasn't really been any shift in public opinion between the pro-independence camp and the anti-independence camp. Actually, the overwhelming majority of the moves that we've seen are within within these camps, and you have Mr. Puigdemont fighting for hegemony within the pro-independence camp with his former government colleague Oriol Junqueras, who is um, still sitting in uh, in jail awaiting trial. And of course, on the other side, you have the the Socialist Party and and Ciudadanos, who are fighting for for the leadership of the anti-independence camp. I mean, I think these, these, these elections will be won on turnout and on the ability of each one of the camps to mobilize its own vote. So far, it is the pro-independence camp that has demonstrated its ability to take people to the streets and mobilize its electorate. But I, I, I think the, the, the peak, they've reached their peak of mobilization and now it's the other side, the, the anti-independent electorate that is now showing its ability to mobilize in a way that it hasn't before historically. Those voters that did not see themselves as nationalists were much more likely to, to ignore Catalan regional elections. This is not likely to be the case this time. We've seen a hypermobilization on both sides of the national divide, if you like. And we could see turnout exceeding 80%. So really, the winner will be determined by whoever can get its vote out. Roberto Robales, uh, Senior Associate at uh, Global Council. Thank you very much there for your analysis. Thanks for having me. Arab leaders have warned of dangerous consequences after a series of actions by Donald Trump that suggest he may be following through on a campaign pledge to move the US embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. The controversial move would be seen as US recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital, and that could trigger unrest across the region. Well, let's cross live to our Jerusalem correspondent, Iris Makla. Uh, and Iris, Trump called the Palestinian, the Jordanian, the Israeli presidents uh, earlier to warn them of this decision that we're expecting tomorrow, Wednesday. What did he say in those calls? What we know uh, is what we have had reported from the Palestinian leadership. And the Palestinian um, leadership reports both in the official news agency and in tweets at the time that what Donald Trump told Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas is that he is planning to move, he intends to move the US embassy to Jerusalem. That would be a change of decades of American foreign policy um, and international policy, actually, because um, other nations also do not have their embassies in Jerusalem. Other nations who have diplomatic relations with Israel don't have their embassies in Jerusalem. So um, we don't know what that means. You know, he's going to, Donald Trump will speak tomorrow uh, and clarify. But does intends mean intends Thursday morning after he's spoken? Or is it something longer term? Does he ever have other plans in place? But we do know that the, he was warned by the Palestinian president that this was a, a dangerous move. It joins warnings that he has had from Saudi Arabia, from Jordan, you know, from allies of the US in the Middle East, uh, from very angry response from Turkey. So we are seeing that he has had these warnings. Uh, he knows that this is in the ether. And nevertheless, this seems to be the decision that Donald Trump is making.
And Iris, where does this leave uh, Trump on his pledge to deliver the deal of the century, his words, uh, in the Middle East? That's it. You see, he's got two competing priorities. His campaign promise to move the embassy, the American embassy, to Jerusalem and implicitly recognise Jerusalem as Israel's capital, along with that move. Uh, and the other, the other promise or the other commitment that he has to the deal of the century, to being the one who will deliver Middle East peace that no one else has been able to do. So those two things stand in opposition to each other. Although the timing is the interesting thing, you know, because he could still intend to move the embassy and wait until his peace plan, at least they fly it and see how it goes. That's meant to be in March 2018. What um, the Palestinian president told him is that he will no longer be someone they can trust as a broker if he does move the embassy. So in effect, he's shooting his own peace plan in the foot before it even gets out. So it's a very interesting situation. It's not clear to me why he has taken this move at this time. I guess we have to wait till tomorrow night to hear um, President Trump explain it himself. Iris Makler in Jerusalem there. The International Olympic Committee has announced its decision to ban Russia from next year's Games after a state-sponsored doping scandal that has shaken the world of athletics for more than two years. Uh, the Russian Olympic uh, Committee is suspended with immediate effect. Individual clean Russian athletes will be able to participate under strict conditions at the Olympic Winter Games Pyeongchang 2018. These invited athletes will participate, be it in individual or team competitions, under the name Olympic Athlete from Russia, with the acronym OAR. They will compete with the uniform bearing this name and under the Olympic flag. The Olympic anthem will be played in any ceremony. Well, for more on this, I'm joined in the studio by our sports ed editor, Ketevan Gorgistani. Hi, Ket. Hello. Uh, where does this leave? I mean, the first question, where does this leave uh, the dreams of Russian athletes in terms of Olympics? Can they ever play again in the Olympic Games? Yes, they definitely uh, can, but the IOC uh, came just, stopped just short of a full-on blanket ban. We heard Thomas Bach explaining that what that really meant. That means that all of the members of the Russian Olympic Committee have been banned, suspended from attending or competing at the Olympic Games. That includes the athletes. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we're not going to see any Russian athletes at these Olympic Games. The IOC said it would authorize Russian athletes uh, to compete. He said it, OAR, Olympic Athletes of Russia. Russia without displaying the Russian flag, without having the Russian anthem. In case they win a gold medal, we'll see the Olympic flag and we'll hear the Olympic anthem, but they will be carrying the name of Russia still. Uh, the list of athletes that will be decided by the International Olympic Committee itself, by invitation only, and of course, under very strict conditions, mainly no prior doping violations and also undergoing a very strict testing before these games. What about the Winter Olympics? Uh, obviously, Russia, a big part of that. What does an, a Winter Olympics look like without Russian athletes? Well, it's definitely going to change the face, at least of the Pyeongchang uh, Games that are coming up in uh, February. Uh, Russia has always been a powerhouse of uh, Winter Olympics. So we've seen at the Sochi Games in 2014, before you take away all uh, the doping, Russia topped the medals table. They had 33 medals, including 13 uh, gold. Since then, though, 25 athletes have been banned from the Olympics for life, uh, stripping Russia of 11 medals, including four Olympic uh, titles. But even if you put away Sochi and the doping. Uh, Russia has always been a top country. In 2006 at uh, Vancou uh, Turin, they finished fourth with eight goals and 22 a total. That's pretty much what they're left with after uh, the doping uh, bans. And they had a little slump in uh, Vancouver in 2010, but they still, with that slump, managed to uh, win 15 medals total, three golds. So they, they're still uh, a country uh, to reckon with at uh, the Winter Olympics. So not seeing them there is going to be a big deal and the biggest sport, the biggest illustration of uh, Russia missing the Winter Olympics is really uh, hockey because you already have the NHL stars from the US, from Canada and Russia 
not taking part in uh, the hockey at the Olympics. Now uh, the KHL, which is Russia's uh, hockey league, the second best league in the world, saying that Well, we're not going to let our uh, players come anyway. And so Russia will likely miss out on possibly winning a medal uh, in hockey. And hockey itself, without all these big stars, is not going to be the same uh, without the Russians. So very much a change in the face of sports. Kitivan Gorgistani, our sports editor there. Thanks a lot. Now, the UN Human Rights Chief has said genocide cannot be ruled out against Rohingya Mus Muslims by Burmese state forces. Well over half a million minority Rohingya have fled to Bangladesh to escape violence since August. Burma's army says it's targeting Rohingya Mus militants. But the UN says the campaign against the Rohingya has all the hallmarks of crimes against humanity. Can anyone rule out that elements of genocide may be present. Ultimately, this is a legal determination only a competent court can make, but the concerns are extremely serious and clearly call for access to be immediately granted for further verification. But it's time now for business and Kate Moody, our business editor, joins me in the uh, studio. How are you, Kate? Hi there, Belle. Uh, and we're starting with you, the European Union, which has taken a concrete step towards cracking down on tax evasion. That's right. This has been several years in the making, of course, following the Panama Papers and the Paradise 